Okay. Okay now? Yeah, I think that's better. Okay, we are in Getting to Know Jesus, volume 6, page 105 to 116. We're on lesson uh, 75. We're getting close to being halfway through the Getting to Know Jesus Bible study series. Just almost there. I can't wait so, to see the next book. And, and we've got so much we're going to enjoy doing. Our Bible text is pages 106 and 107. The lesson notes are on pages 108 to 113. And there's room for there for you to write notes in your book. And I think we've got an extra book back there on the table if you didn't bring yours. Uh, we're going to talk about Jesus stresses the danger of sin. Uh, or uh, if I may... Quip a title from a song of a few years back, Johnny Be Good. Oh, yeah. And if your name's not Johnny, you won't be good anyhow. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Here's our timeline. And look at this. I got a new laser pointer so I can even point out where we are on the timeline. We're getting down here well into the third year of ministry. Uh, probably, I am just guess, probably six to nine months away from the crucifixion in Jesus' timeline of events. Uh, did your father or mother ever tell you when you went off to school or out to play <laughs> to be good? No, they said don't get in any trouble because I'll whip the car out of you when you get home. Ooh. That's right. And what did, they, what did you do when they said don't? They did it. I yep. shuddered. Oh, I didn't oh you knew they meant it, huh? Or they do. I didn't. Well, hopefully they said more to be good, but if they didn't, they were going to whip the tar out of you. You decided that way. Well, you better be good. <coughs> Societies always favor the good guy and dislike the bad guy. Now, I know that there have been some who've tried to make the bad guy look like the good guy, and the good guy look like the bad guy. Uh, there, there have been quite a few of those out there. And part of the reason is because they're so bad, they don't know how to be good. And so if they can make the bad guy look like the good guy, then they don't feel so bad for being so bad. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Stories from nursery rhymes to novels, magazines to movies focus on good triumphing over some personified evil. And that evil may be a monster from outer space, or it may be uh, something in the kids' Bobby closet. The robot. What, George? I'm so good, I don't know how to be bad. Oh, oh, God. God. I hope that that God is yeah. the Bible said about the right. Yes. Right, go for the destruction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, oh. It's so thick in here, we need a shovel. You shovel. made a comment over here? Where's that humility? Hey, it's my birthday. I can get a play with it. Well, tragically, like I said, some authors try to make good look evil so they can justify making evil look good. How important is it to you to be a good and good person? We have an inherent desire to be good and to be thought of others as a good person. Even John Dillinger, when he was being pursued by the Chicago police, thought he was just trying to be a good person, protecting his mother or something like that. I forget the details of that. But, you know, that you ask the bad guys, did you kill this person? Well, yeah, but I was trying to help somebody or protect somebody. Right? They can always justify to say it was good for me to do this bad thing. Uh, whether the courts would The devil made me do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. So how much do you want others to think of you for the good you do, and that there be no bad or wrongdoing or evil in your life? Oh, how I wish I could erase those bad me too. things me in too. my life. Me too. Me too. Yes. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, my favorite games were cops and robbers, yep. cowboys and Indians, yep. and war games. Hey, now, like I was always a cop, never the robber. I was always a cowboy, never the Indian. I was always the American soldier, not the other soldier. I wanted to be a good guy. Uh, in one year of uh, uh, working as a camp counselor, the camp director and the staff came up with this big skit. And every camper in that camp, we could camp, had a role in this game that they were playing. Some were Roman soldiers, some were just 
citizens, some were uh, uh, conniving, evil, sneaky people, some would bribe their way, others would lie, cheat, and steal, others were, were uh, zealous for God. And they would kill the Roman soldiers, uh, well, you know, within the parameters of the boundaries of the game. But it was a role-playing type game, and each person had been basically assigned a role, except for one thing. They forgot about me. I don't really do your pride a real humble act there. <coughs> but they gave me the job of being a Christian, but um, not necessarily a, a real definitive Role. So when one of the Roman soldiers came up and asked you, are you a Christian? I couldn't lie. My conscience wouldn't let me. I got thrown in prison for the rest of the game. And nobody was able to get in to rescue me. Frustrating. But I, I like I said, I want to be the good guy. I don't want to be the bad guy. How serious are you of not about not becoming the topic of some scandal or criminal activity? We all don't, we, we don't want that on our, our track record. Well, we're reading in Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 through 14, Mark 9, verses 38 to 50, and Luke 9, verses 49 to 50. Jesus stresses the importance of doing what is right and not causing other people to do wrong deeds. So not only me doing right, it's me not doing things that would cause you to do wrong. Oh, boy. There's a few things in that area I'd like to back up and do over. Since sin is doing things we know are wrong is what separates us from God and eternity in heaven, it is something we definitely want to out of our lives. If you love God just that much, as much as He loves you, you don't want any sin in your life. You don't want anything that would separate you from God and His love. So in order that we might in, be completely forgiven, might it be wise to learn how to refrain from doing evil completely? Wouldn't it be good to develop our sense of knowledge of right and wrong to the point that we could see temptation coming before it even gets there and say, whoops, I'm not going there. That's a real challenge. That's going to be a real good test for you. God, I love you so much. Oh, I know these areas are areas where I am tempted, and I'm not even going to get close to them. So I, because I, I don't want to be bad. I don't want to slip. I don't want to fall. Did you get that up there? Did you get that one written down? Yes, I did. Okay. I, I kind of abbreviated it. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're you, go, you, go, you go too fast. And my advancer, <laughs> uh, there we go. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I got ahead of the computer. Got, okay. Glenn, can you get the stand out of the way? Is it, oh, yeah. stand out of the way. Yeah, it might be good. Yeah. Oh, that's right. better. Stand is out of the way, Laurel's out of the way, and we're all hearty. Okay, good intentions won't make us good. Mark 9, 38 to 41, Luke 9, 49 to 50. Somebody did a typo there. I'm going to have to have a long talk with him. Uh, Teacher! <laughs> yeah, I'll see him tomorrow morning about time to shave. Master, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ cert will certainly not lose his reward. So, there, just got to develop the right touch. Good intentions won't make us good. Our text starts with the apostles coming to Jesus thinking they're doing good because they stopped somebody from driving out demons in Jesus' name who wasn't a part of their group. Now that was right. way too fast. When it works, it really works. <laughs> when it doesn't work, it's slower than Christmas. We're working on it. See, the apostles had good intentions. They thought they were doing the right thing uh, in trying to stop this person who may not have had his beliefs about Jesus right. Have you ever encountered somebody that maybe is a, a baby Christian or, or a little new in their faith and, and they were teaching others something and you say, oh, I can't let this person teach. They're not mature enough yet to be a teacher. 
Sometimes the best teachers are the ones that are least mature because they're learning. Right. But that's a whole different topic. But we mean well. I mean, we, we want to protect the flock. This is where our elders can sometimes be really challenged. Especially if they take the preacher as the one they need to attack instead of the members of the flock that are uh, getting caught away in, in strange doctrines. Uh, but they, they, the apostles thought they were doing a good thing. They meant well. They didn't realize what they were doing was, was not so good. And so Jesus scolds them for doing good, for their wanting to do good, but they had wrong intentions. <coughs> so he has to kind of advise them a little bit. All of us want to do good things with our lives. <coughs> we intend to do what is right, but oftentimes we get caught up in our own importance or thinking, uh, uh, thinking someone else is wrong or whether we can prove it or not, and we think we have to make them conform to our rules. It's not whether I am right, it's just that I think I'm right, and I think you're wrong, so I'm going to force you to agree with me. Uh, I don't know what we can do that we get into a situation like that. Let's see now. Could we have an argument over what color the seats should be or the carpet? Or should we design a dog? Should we have contemporary music or should we stay with the old organ and the hymns? And, and if we go back to the hymns, how modern hymns are we going to allow? I mean, some of those hymns are not that old. Should we go back to the hymns of the 1500s? Or maybe we should go back to the hymns of the apostles and uh, the early church. But I don't know if anybody knows them. But some of the things that we can get caught up in and, and arguing over and the, to shortcut the whole program when we get to heaven, it's not going to be on the final, it's not going to make one bit of difference, but how many churches are split? Oh. How many Christians have said, I'm never going to church again because they got a doctrine or somebody got a doctrine a little confused you know and really got some rules that weren't in agreement with God. You know what's really sad is when you go into a church and <laughs> people are discontented with whatever is going on and they just obscond through the church and then they never go back to church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, yeah. that is really sad to pick out some. Then it's organized, it becomes organized religion. That's not organized religion. Now one thing we are discovering, even here, these guys have been intently with Jesus, intently for over a year, and casually for a year prior to that. So they've known about him for over two years. I, I have a question. And they still don't have it straight. Martha? I have a question. Um, you know, back in the early or late 60s, I remember a lady, her name was Catherine Kuhlman. She was out of Los Angeles. I believe in miracles. Oh, yeah, she was great. I thought she was great. Mm -hmm. I really did. She died of cancer, which I didn't know until later on. But I was just wondering, how can you decipher? Because then you have Henny, what's his name? Pat. Ben Henny. Ben Henny. Oh, he's, he's ben a prophet, too. Ben Henny. I, I don't Benny know. Ben Henny. Ben I, I was one of his charter members. But I don't know if 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 he's a, if he's doing what's right or not. They chased him out of uh, yeah. Florida. Uh, we, 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 no, could, we could divert the whole discussion to that and not I'm just solve asking the problem. a question. May I answer that in one statement? I don't, want, I don't want to get into that. May I answer Martha's yeah. question in one statement? Anything that you see here, anyone that speaks, measure it on the basis of what the Word of God says and you'll be all right. Our bottom line is who Jesus is. Yes. And we also have to realize that different people have different gifts. Mm -hmm. And I cannot explain and I cannot really, I mean, I have an opinion, but I cannot honestly judge whether a person is or isn't. I have to let God do that. I know that even some of those who have been found to be charlatans have yet won people to Christ. So, yeah, this person may not conform to my standards, but does that mean he doesn't conform to God's standards? And does that mean that God can't use him or her to still accomplish good for his kingdom? <laughs> That's like, is the truth, but you still got to use the measuring rod. You've got to use, yeah, you got to, you got to, if it conflicts with scripture, then you've got a conflict. But if it is not anti-scriptural uh, or unscriptural or against the law, then does it necessarily it's, mean it's like Jimmy Swagger? You know, I mean, he did something. He was he did the stuff that was wrong, but he also won a lot of souls to Christ. He won a lot of souls to Christ, yeah. 
Jim Baker won a lot of souls to yep. Christ. Yeah. And, uh, he yep. paid a price for an indiscretion that he made. Uh, I've made mistakes that I don't want to tell you about. I wish I could go back and undo them. Every one of us here could say that. The focus I think we need to focus on is what can I do to be more right <coughs> with God. Right. Uh, the game that so many people play, and, and so many Christians play, is how bad can I be and still be good? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's I'm just a, a little person. It's just a little sin. It won't hurt me into heaven. I'm a good person. <laughs> I'm a good person. I just killed this guy because I hated him. He, no. he ran me off the road, so I just shot him dead. But I'm a good person. Now, they say that when they're doing something like living with somebody without the benefit of marriage. That's where I hear that is. But I'm a good person. Why would God want to judge me on that? Well, we might not want to find out. Nope. I won't the problem that. is that our rules are not always in full agreement with God's rules. And when we criticize other Christians because they worship God differently or believe something about the Bible that is different than our beliefs, we're not doing the kingdom of God any favors. Instead, we are hurting the church and helping the devil destroy what God wants to build. Well, there's something else about being good. Uh, Harming others won't make us good. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, Mark 9, 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around, tied around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now this reference is a little more towards children, but uh, still applies, very seriously. Jesus had just taken, spoken about the humility of a little child, how they so quickly will trust an adult and believe whatever they are told. Now he points out how, how terrible it is to teach a child or an adult to do wrong things or believe that which is not true. Anyone who does such a thing would be better off dead than to be found guilty of violating a child or causing a child to do things that are wrong. And boy, there are some people that I think need the death penalty. Pedophiles yeah. are the first example that comes to mind yeah. of people who violate little children. But what about parents who tell their children to lie about something that the parent wants to cover up? The phone rings, and it's it's Bob from Collections. Oh, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> tell him I'm in the bathroom. How about adults who do the wrong things and try to pretend it was justified and okay for them to do it? Like the time my brother-in-law didn't stop at a stop sign. And, you know, I could see it had a clear view of the highway, so it wasn't like he couldn't see nobody was coming. But then when I did it, and my sister was riding with me, uh, I said, well, he did it. <laughs> Next time I was riding with him, when we came to the stop sign, there, I stopped. <laughs> I can imagine that my sister had a few words to say to him. I was just a kid in high school back then, just learning to drive, you know. So setting a good example was significantly important. So we want to, as adults, make sure we're doing the right thing. Our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, and our grandchildren too for that matter, are watching us. Exactly. They've got their... You may think they're watching cartoons, they know what's going on over here. And you may think they are not paying a word of attention to what you're saying. Oh, and then yeah. ten minutes later, they'll yeah. spot you almost a verbatim. Yeah. There's somebody down there. You say, <gasps> they heard that. <clears throat> Be careful, little mouths, what you say. <laughs> the father up above is looking down in love through that little child or grandchild or great-grandchild of yours. And they are absorbing it like a sponge. And if it's okay for grandma or grandpa or great grandpa to do that, you know it's okay for me to do that. No. I can say that because I've got some great grandchildren and we did get to babysit one uh, fairly frequently right now. So, yes, uh, 
How about parents that justify their wrong? How about children are influenced by what they saw that person do? And adults who belittle or criticize a child can harm that child for life. How many children whose lives have been ruined because a mother, mother said, Yeah, no good. Or our father said, don't do that, you'll never amount to anything. You're stupid. Or you're, fat. how many girls have been ruined because somebody in the family said, you're fat. Oh, yeah. I've been and the last that. thing any girl wants to hear is, you're fat, even if it's true. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll eat themselves to skinny. Karen Carpenter ate herself to death, starved herself to death. Yeah. Probably. Because of a insecurity, or insecurity about her, and she was not. She was an attractive young lady, yeah. beautiful voice. Love to hear her sing. Me but that's too. off the subject. Harming others will not make us good. And children absorb you like a sponge. We now, if you tell a children, a child, you keep doing that, you're going to be the greatest ball player. You keep doing that, you're going to be a great preacher. You keep doing that, you're going to be a wonderful teacher. That child will aspire because just like us adults, they want to be good. Why do I keep doing this? Because people keep coming up and saying, hey, Glenn, you're good. They like what I do, and I like what I do, and if you like what I do, and I like what I do, and God likes what I do, we're all on the right track. Now, if I can like what you do, that makes it even better. I like my old buddy Will Rogers. Yeah. The thing that I like most about Will Rogers, I'm doing a book report. Most of you already heard the story, so I'll just really condense it down. I'm doing a book report in high school and uh, on Will Rogers. And uh, the thing I got out of that book more than anything else was he said, I never met a man I didn't like. Yeah. His philosophy of life would take the person no matter who <laughs> they were. You could give him a criminal. And he would find something good about that criminal. I wouldn't mean he would justify them not being executed for their crime or thrown in jail, but he would still find something good about that person and like that good quality in that person, no matter how bad the rest of them were. Their, their life was. Oh, what we would do for our world if we would go looking for the good in other people. Somebody asked Andrew Carnegie how he had to get, uh, was it the six or 36 millionaires working for him? And uh, he said, well, they weren't millionaires when I started, but when they started, I just found the gold in them and helped bring it out. He found the thing they were good at and helped them to be good at it, and in the process of being good at it, they became millionaires. So, life isn't all about money, but sometimes that could really help out a lot. <laughs> but being, finding what you're good at. That's what the, the classes that we're going to be offering here soon are going to be doing. Find your gift and find out what you're good at so you can focus on doing what you're good at and bless God's kingdom and even bless your own life as well at the same time. So find out what your children are good at. Encourage them in it, even when it going gets tough. Encourage them in it and watch them excel. Well, let's go one step further. Oh, here's that picture. Uh, even flowers still bloom around the ruins of Capernaum. The city may be uh, just a bunch of stone that used to be piled on top of another, but flowers still grow there. Well, this is somewhere in Capernaum. Nice to know that some of the flowers that we have over here grow over there too. We sometimes think that we're the only ones that have life the way we have it. <laughs> in some respects that's true, but not all. Well, Jesus, the city won't make us good. Uh, i got to go back here. We gotta read this. Sinning will not make us good. Matthew chapter 7, 18, <coughs> verses 7 to 9, Mark 9, verses 42 to 50. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man to whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Oh, now you're getting ahead of me again. I didn't do that. Oh, jeez. Can I go backwards? Yes. Okay, there. It is far better to enter life maimed or crippled than with two hands or feet to go into the eternal fire. Uh, Mark called it hell. The, where the fire never goes out. That's eternal. 
And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It's far better, better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell where the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. Everyone shall be salted with fire. Now salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salt again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We could take this and start a discussion on what hell is, but that's a little bit outside of the context. We may mention a bit about it here in a minute. Okay, let's try this here. Once. There we go. <coughs> and sinning will not make us good. Uh, pressing the button just right will make us advance. Okay. Jesus warns the apostles about the seriousness of of one little sin. Temptation is a part of life, but you will not, but to allow temptation to cause us to do even one little sin, if there is such a thing as a little sin, will keep us from God's presence. Sin separates us from God. And it doesn't matter whether it's a big, heinous, oh, I killed 25 people, uh, uh, men, women, and children at school. Or whether it's, oh, I snuck out of the store and didn't pay for the bubble gum. It's still a sin. It's a violation of what God says is right or wrong. Now, <coughs> Jesus says it's better to lose a part of your body than for that part to cause us for sin. However, this is not a case for self-mutilation. The point <laughs> he's trying to make is that sin is so serious that you want to recognize temptation and say no to it before it becomes sin. And God, through Jesus Christ, living in you, gives you the power to say no to that temptation before it becomes sin. And that is far greater power than being able to heal somebody else, as nice as that may be. That's far greater power than to be the president or the king or emperor or whatever of some great country and be able to dictate a law and make all the people obey it. <coughs> because even the kings and dictators and presidents have sin in their lives that they cannot conquer if they don't get their lives right with God. So here's the greatest power. Learn and recognize temptation. And learning that sin is so bad, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the attitude that most of us approach life is how bad can I be and still be good? Instead of how good can I be? Because somebody is watching. Doing things that you know are selfish and wrong is what separates you from God in the first place. <laughs> Why do you want to continue separating yourself from a God who loves you so much as our Heavenly Creator loves you? Why would you reject Jesus? Now, oh, wait a minute. Now, you're getting, I'm, I'm pushing too hard, and we're getting too sensitive here. Uh, there we go. Why would you reject Je what Jesus would do on the cross by continuing in the behavior that caused Him to go to the cross in the first place? I don't have it on tonight, but during the Easter season, I was wearing the button that said, I'm responsible. It was, I'm responsible. We cannot blame the Jews for crucifying Christ. We cannot blame the Romans for crucifying Christ. I am the one responsible for crucifying Christ. If I had not sinned, He would not have had to die for me. And so, I'm responsible for the death of Christ. And if we could take that attitude... And if we can love Him with just a fraction of the love with which He has loved us, we will say to temptation, you go to hell with the devil. I'm not going down that road. No, I am not going to succumb to this temptation. Well, we've got one more thing about helping Johnny be good. Or Mary or whoever else. Loving others will make us good. Woo! That's nice to know! I've been trying to figure out all night what I could do to be good instead of all this stuff about what I'm doing that's bad. Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through uh, 24. <coughs> no, 10 through 14. Another typo. Boy, there we go. I 
I'm going to have to have a long talk about that guy again. <laughs> Jesus illustrates his, uh, well, actually, seeing, uh, don't do it yet, okay. Seeing that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. He's talking about that little child that we could have so <clears throat> much power influencing. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety and nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. And in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any one of these little ones should be lost. Did you get it? If I aim it the right way, Well, the thing is in there on the computer, but the projector is up here. I shouldn't be aiming at the computer, but it shouldn't make any difference. There we go. Loving others will make us good. Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. There we go. <coughs> Jesus illustrates the point by reflecting how a shepherd will leave his entire flock to search for one sheep that wandered safely from the safety of the flock and got lost. And, and you, you've been there. You spend more time looking for a, a quarter that fell down in between the crack and the car. Hope you don't do it while you're driving. Or you'll, you'll spend time looking for uh, your sunglasses. Yeah, I've got another pair over there, but I want this pair. And oh, I found them. And you're so happy about it. Think how happy God is when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The point is that we should care about those that are not walking with Jesus, and seek to help them find their way into the safety of God's fold. That those who are in the fold are safe. The church is the only organization that I know of that exists for the benefit of its members, non-members. We're already saved. And having a little social club here because this makes me feel good isn't going to help advance the kingdom of God. But realizing it's not about me. Okay, this makes me feel good, but what, what would it draw those people out there to want to come in and be a part of this family of God? That takes some prayer. That takes some time. It takes some giving up. Well, I like this, but, but this just doesn't relate to them anymore. And so we have to think, uh, rethink. Now, the gospel message is still the same, but how we present that gospel message changes. <coughs> In my early years of ministry, I thought the preacher had to be out calling on people and inviting them to church all the time. And so I would just, a lot of times, Sunday afternoons, a lot of times, I would just go visiting. And I wouldn't call and say, hey, can I come over? I'd pull up in front, come knock on your door, and hope you weren't too busy, was in the mood for company, and I'd spend 15, 30 minutes, an hour, chit-chatting with you, and then I'd go on to the next place. Nowadays, you better call first because they're either too busy or not at home. And, or they're in a gated community and you're not going to get past the front gate if you don't call and let them know you're coming. And so, so methods have changed. The message is the same. I want you to come to know Jesus. I want you to have a personal, a passionate, and powerful relationship with Jesus Christ so you'll be more like Him. But how I go about reaching people with that message... Fifty years ago, I went and knocked on your door, or I'd meet you in a coffee shop, mm -hmm. or I'd talk to people out there on the street. Nowadays, I get on the internet, and I post stuff on my Facebook page, and I try to find ways to get people to go to my website and take a look. and say, you know what, this is something I need to know more about. I don't know Jesus as well as I need to be. Need to. <clears throat> those who are in the fold are safe, but those outside are lost. Life is not about doing what I want. But and not about life is about not it's not about not caring for others. I know it's a double negative. It makes you really wonder. Our purpose on earth is to love God and love people. When we love others, we are care about their lives and their needs. That's how we keep ourselves from indulging in wrong deeds. If I'm busy looking at how can I show you God's love. I'm sure not going to want to be engaged in what I could do that I wouldn't want you to see me doing. 
I would not want to be engaged in sin. I want to honor God. So maybe the prayer is, God, how can I show others that I love you? And your conscience will say, yeah, should you really be doing that? Okay, I won't do it this time. I'll never do it again. Because I want to love God. And I want other people to see Christ in me. So they'll love God too. We have our work cut out for us. And the eight. If for some reason you slip. And sometimes we do. We all do. Senior pastors, associate pastors, youth leaders. Anybody that's trying to serve God is going to sometimes just have one of those days. When whoops, I did something I shouldn't have done today. God is a God of grace. And just like when an alcoholic <coughs> falls off the wagon and they take another drink, you start over. That's true. One day at a time. Sure. One day at a time. One day at a time. Okay, I didn't do that today. I didn't do that. Last it's like falling week. off your diet, too. You can always start Falling back off on. your diet. Yeah, you can yeah. always start back on tomorrow. I stepped on the scale this morning. I know I probably had too much to eat for dinner tonight, and I'm going to have a piece of birthday cake here in just a little bit. Me, too. Because uh, George had a birthday. And we're all looking forward to it. So let's get on with it, Glenn. You're holding up the party. Yeah. But our conclusion is this. Don't think you can sin and not suffer. All sin has negative consequences. In fact, all sin is selfishness. I am yet to find a sin that is not selfish. And if you find one, again, I will put out the challenge. Please let me know. I may have to revamp my thinking. But all sin is about me. I want what I want. I deserve. I have a right. I'm entitled. That sounds like selfishness. And your sin hurts others. Now, also, I've heard people say, oh, there's a victimless crime. The victimless crime still hurts others. <laughs> and victimless crimes are usually having sex with somebody outside of marriage. Victimless crimes are sometimes related to having drugs uh, or getting drunk at home. and They don't think it hurts anybody. But uh, it does. Don't kid yourself. We don't want to get engaged in those kinds of things. Your sin hurts other people. <coughs> well, next week, Jesus is going to show us his human limitations and point us to the path of greatness. Wait, Jesus? <coughs> limitations? <coughs> Wait a minute. Uh, you just have to come back and see. Right now, we're going to turn over to page 114 and break up into our discussion groups and go through some discussion questions. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and Keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.